Uh, is the microphone on? Oh, this one. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you very much. We're very pleased to welcome you to the fourth annual World Food Institute lecture, and we're very pleased to be able to present Dr. James Hester, who is the rector of the United Nations University. We're in kind of a hurry because we were sitting qu uh, very quietly eating, and the food was just coming a little more slowly than we thought it would. So if you'll just forgive us for a minute as we catch our breath. Dr. Hester is the first rector of United Nations University, and he has, been in, has held that position since September 1975. He will be telling us about the concept and philosophy of the United Nations University, but it is different from the regular and our ordinary universities, as I'm sure most of you probably are aware. Uh, Dr. Hester has traveled widely before he became part of the United Nations University. Uh, his father was a Navy chaplain, and he traveled during the time that he was in um, school. He attended Princeton University and uh, received his bachelor's degree there in 1945. After that, he became part of the um, military service and was a Japanese language officer. After the war, he entered Pembroke College in, at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and earned his bachelor's degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. Uh, he served briefly then, again in the um, Marines, I believe, after uh, earning his bachelor's, second bachelor's degree. And this is an interesting phrase in his, bi in his biography. Uh, it says, after he left the services, he spent several months at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., doing research for his doctoral thesis. At Iowa State, several months would simply not do, Dr. Hester. It would take a little longer than that. Uh, we'll be interested to know how you got that accomplished. Uh, he was in business briefly for uh, three years as a management consultant, uh, and then he has since that time been in academic life, primarily as an administrator. He was provost of the Brooklyn Center for Long Island University in New York, vice president of, this, of the Long Island University. In 1960, became dean of both the undergraduate and graduate schools of arts and sciences at New York University and president of New York University in 1962 at the age of 37. And as I recall, the newspaper said the youngest college president of a major university at that time. Uh, he served on a number of task forces dealing with priorities in higher education. And I expect priorities in higher education have something to do with his present interest in the United Nations University. Uh, he is and was a member of the executive committee of the American, uh, the Association of American Universities, to which Iowa State University does belong. Uh, he currently is living in Tokyo, Japan. If you read the papers recently, you know that that has now been declared the most expensive city in the world to live. Uh, in addition, uh, Dr. Hester said he would prefer to be rather informal this evening and uh, therefore would like to describe the United Nations University primarily in a dialogue between the audience and himself, although he will make a fairly short formal talk at the beginning so that he will then have time to answer questions and to respond to comments from the audience. Dr. Hester. There was a year of research before that oh. in Oxford. <laughs> and many bitter years after that before I finally completed it. It is a great pleasure to be here. I think I'm talking to you about something very important, which is rather hard to explain. And I've learned that it is easier to explain it in answer to questions than it is to try to describe it directly. So I will present brief formal remarks and then hope that you will ask me as many questions as possible. In company with all the world's universities, the United Nations University has as its purposes the pursuit 
and sharing of knowledge for the enhancement of human existence. Its purposes are the same as those of traditional universities, but the structure is different. The UN University, as its name implies, has a worldwide mandate. Its responsibilities, according to its charter, are to identify pressing global problems of human survival, development, and welfare, and then to organize networks of collaborating scientists and scholars around the world to help solve them. That is a new kind of academic structure for a new kind of interdependent world, but doing what universities have always done, helping scholars to help humanity. The problems that concern the UN University are naturally problems that concern the American academic community. Our three initial programs are focused on problems of human and social development, the use and management of natural resources, and world hunger. At the outset, with only limited resources, the emphasis in our work is on the developing countries, but it is not limited to them. The convergence of interest between our World Hunger Program and your World Food Institute is obvious, but I am sure that it, there is equal interest among you in problems of ecology, energy, or human rights and development, all of which are UNU concerns as well. This new kind of academic institution, made up of global networks of collaborating institutions and individuals, provides the American academic community, as well as scholars of other countries, opportunities to share responsibilities and benefits with colleagues throughout the world under broad international and non-political auspices. One of the very few places on Earth where you can find Americans, Chinese, and Vietnamese sitting down together is in UNU program activities. Although the UNU is sponsored by the United Nations and UNESCO, it is an autonomous, non-intergovernmental organization with a guarantee of academic freedom written into its charter and approved by the General Assembly. It is supported by income from an endowment fund, a further protection from political interference. The UNU is controlled by and works through scholars, not governments. The campus of the university is located literally throughout the world, with a small headquarters staff in Tokyo coordinating its work. The university is now linked to units of almost 100 universities and research institutes in 60 countries. Thus, it can draw on worldwide scholarly resources without duplicating costly facilities or adding to the brain drain. The most significant fact about the United Nations University is that it is genuinely a genuinely global academic institution, the first and only one of its kind created expressly to meet the research, advanced training, and knowledge dissemination needs of an increasingly interdependent world. We see evidence of growing interdependence everywhere. Our world runs on trade agreements, communication arrangements, and mutual defense pacts, energy schemes, and foreign aid for formulas, and we can expect more in the future. Provincialism in such a world is a dangerous anachronism, if not suicidal. The UNU was created to help the world of science and scholarship deal more effectively with this new reality. Unlike most universities, it is not an institution to provide trained manpower and knowledge to meet national requirements. Unlike most international organizations, it is not an intergovernmental body, but can provide the setting to debate and clarify today's issues without clouds of political controversy obscuring facts. In sum, the UNU mobilizes scholars and scientists internationally to focus on vast, complex, and subtle global problems, to examine them from many points of view, and to disseminate the results of this work in practical forms that can be used by those who must make policy decisions. I mentioned earlier that the university's work is supported by contributions 
to an endowment fund. 25 UN member states and the Holy See, and these governments are both industrialized and those of industrialized and developing countries, with Japan as the outstanding example, have demonstrated their faith in the UNU by contributing or pledging contributions. But our country, the United States, has yet to do either. And that is ironic, since the new internationalism, of which the UNU is an expression, is clearly consistent with many ideas that are widely approved in this country today. Many Americans are tired of development assistance in the form of handouts and want to see evidence that developing countries are trying to help themselves. They are looking for partners in solving problems that concern us all. Such partnership is a function of the UNU. Many Americans no longer see their role in the world as economic, technological, or cultural missionaries. They want cooperative problem solving and not dependency. They want long-term sustainable development programs that build self-reliance rather than paternalistic methods and short-term results. Greater self-reliance in the developing countries is a primary objective of the work of the UNU. The tragedy of the failure of the United States to support the UNU so far is that the UN University has effectively overcome many of the objections to foreign assistance Americans have expressed. In one major respect, however, the UN University has benefited from the resources of this country. Americans played a major part in developing the UNU. A distinguished American, the late Dr. Andrew Cordier, former president of Columbia University and former undersecretary general of the United Nations, was chairman of the founding committee, a study group of international experts that designed the university structure. Dr. Cordier and his colleagues recognized that the nature and causes of the world's most urgent problems required an institution that could mobilize scholarship on a global scale. Today, the participation of American scholars is vital in several of our most significant projects. A distinguished family sociologist from Dartmouth, Dr. Elise Bolding, is providing the UNU valuable insights on one of the most critical human dimensions of development, the role that women play. Dr. Jack Ives, a leading environmental scientist who directs the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado, is working with the UNU on the complicated interaction between ectosystems in the world's humid tropic areas. Dr. Chadwick Alger, an Ohio State University political scientist known for his studies of how typical Americans are affected by global interdependence. He directs the U.S. component of a large UNU network studying goals, processes, and indicators of development. Dr. Edward W. Widener, Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay, has been a member of the UN University's Council from the beginning and has made substantial contributions to the evolution of the university's policies and programs. Perhaps nowhere in the university, however, has the American academic community provided such noteworthy scientific leadership as in the World Hunger Program, the first of our three major programs to be launched. Since its earliest stages, that program has been headed by Dr. Nevin S. Scrimshaw, one of the world's leading nutritionists. Dr. Scrimshaw has been university professor and head of the Department of Nutrition and Food Science at MIT, and I need not elaborate any more to this audience on his outstanding credentials. The attack on certain key elements of the World Hunger Program, which Dr. Scrimshaw and his colleagues from many nations are helping us to mount, is naturally of particular interest to this forum, where you are dedicated to building competency for fulfilling the most basic of all human needs, an adequate diet. That is also the objective of the World Hunger Program of the UNU. Our common aim is a striking example of how the work of the United Nations University is direct, directly linked to the interests of the American university community. In the view of many observers, the creation of the land-grant college was the step that led directly to the unparalleled prosperity of American agriculture, a system that is the envy of the world. 
the decision of the Iowa State Board of Regents to establish the World Food Institute and thus extend the outreach of Iowa State expertise to the whole world is a logical progression. To those of us who are firmly convinced that the future of our nation is closely tied to the solution of ma major human problems throughout the world, the work you are doing at the World Food Institute is most encouraging. Let me review briefly some of the background of the world hunger problem and then fill you in on what the UNU is doing about it. By some estimates, as many as one quarter of the world's four billion people suffer nutritional inadequacies to a degree that affects their health and growth. A majority of these are children under five, many of whom will die. The ones who live face the grim guarantees of malnutrition, chronic diseases, retarded growth and detrimental effects on learning, behavior, and adult wage earning capacity. As parents unable to provide good food for their children, they start the cycle in motion again. You here at Ames and we in Tokyo recognize that the root causes of hunger are complex. However, many people often assume that the cause of hunger is simply too many people and too little food. It is true that the world population has doubled from two to four billion since 1930, and that a fifth billion will likely be added before the end of the 1980s. However, even with 250,000 more people to feed every day, world food production per capita has not decreased, and it is not likely to do so in the immediate future. In fact, the world produces more than two pounds of grain daily for every man, woman, and child, some 3,000 calories worth, or about what the average American consumes daily. Clearly, the occurrence of hunger and malnutrition is determined far more by the distribution of food within a population than by the absolute production of food per capita. And producing more food will not solve the distribution problem unless nutritious food is grown by needy individuals themselves or unless they have the income or credit to buy food or unless it is dis distributed to them through some organized program. These ideas provide much of the rationale for the activities of the UNU's World Hunger Program. It concentrates specifically on three areas where we believe an international multidisciplinary effort can make major contributions. The first project of the World Hunger Program concentrates on integrating work from many disciplines to train a new kind of expert from the developing countries in national food and nutritional policy planning. Most developing countries could become self-sufficient in food production and distribution if their government policies and programs were properly designed. But with a few notable exceptions, there is a general lack of consideration for nutrition in their national development planning. Their agri agricultural planning tends to be dominated by agribusiness concerns and the production of cash crops for export. The cultivation of staples or varied food crops and high protein legumes for domestic consumption, let alone the assurance of adequate incomes for individual farmers, are often ignored. In addition, little attention is paid to the economic and social costs of neglecting nutrition and health. Second, the university's program is, beginning, is bringing significant new information to light about human nutritional requirements in the developing countries. Human nutritional and diet needs are obviously conditioned by the interaction of the human body with a complex of physical, biological, and social influences. Yet tests to determine nutritional requirements, particularly protein, iron, and calorie needs, have been conducted almost totally on healthy populations in industrialized societies, hardly the proper yardstick by which to measure the diet needs of people in hot, disease-ridden, developing countries. So for the past three years, the World Hunger Program of the UNU, in close cooperation with FAO and WHO, has been examining available nutrition data and generating new information of its own from a network of institutions and individual researchers in the developing world. We will publish the initial findings of these studies this summer. Third, the university has organized research and advanced training activities to increase competency in developing countries for dealing with their staggering food losses after harvest. For example, in the developing world, 
pests, faulty storage, and inadequate processing at the household and village levels wipe out an estimated 20 to 40 percent of cereal grains and over 50 percent of fresh fruits and vegetables after the harvest before they ever reach the home kitchen. Despite the seriousness of such losses, relatively little practical research was being done on these problems at the village level before the university began its work three years ago. A fundamental premises, premise of the university's world hunger program is that much can be done to alleviate hunger and malnutrition even within current economic con constraints. Programs to weigh children and educate mothers about nutrition are within the capacity of low-income rural populations. Almost any country can afford iodization of salt and the distribution of vitamin A capsules to young children to prevent eye damage. Various other vitamins and mineral supplements are available in chemically pure form forms at low cost. But in spite of these optimistic notes, the problem is still confounding in its enormity. And you may ask, with limited resources and with only the instruments of scholarship at its disposal, how can the UN University be expected to make a significant impact when the large staffs and budgets of other international organizations seem unable to turn the tide? Well, many individuals who have worked long and intimately with these organizations consider the UNU a unique opportunity to apply some of the lessons they've learned and to avoid some of the mistakes they've observed. They recognize that the way the UNU operates, training local people to build local self-reliance, is what the developing countries need and want. We use two mechanisms to pursue this approach. First, we have established a network of associated institutions in Guatemala, India, the Philippines, Chile, the United Kingdom, Venezuela, Canada, Ghana, Senegal, and the United States. The American Link, the first associated institution of the UN University in this country, is with a consortium of universities in the Northeast. Activities in this area are coordinated by the International Food and Nutrition Policy Planning Program at MIT and include the facilities of the Harvard School of Public Health. Second, we conduct a distinctive university fellowship program. UNU fellowships are tailored to stem the international brain drain and to help developing nations to establish their own research and development programs. Fellows are selected for their potential to strengthen their own country's intellectual capabilities after they complete a period of research and advanced training at one of the associated institutions of the UNU, mostly in other developing countries. The university retains active contacts with the fellows after they return to their home countries to assist them in applying what they have learned. I notice that your team graduate education task force pursues much the same aims with your foreign graduate students. To date, a total of 77 fellowships have been awarded in this program. 34 fellows have already completed their training and have returned to their home countries. UNU fellows from seven developing countries are currently re receiving advanced training at the Northeast Consortium that I mentioned. While the World Hunger Program has developed as a distinct entity, shaping its methods of operation to its particular needs, its work is viewed by the university as closely linked with the other two programs in human and social development and the use and management of natural resources. The university is committed to the proposition that understanding and alleviating complex problems can only be undertaken realistically if they are seen as intimately linked elements of the totality of human existence. Scholars from our three programs are increasingly interacting and discovering that their research has much more in common than they expected. For example, the ecological consequences of deforestation have clear implications for the food scientists in understanding the underlying causes of hunger. These causes, in turn, are important to the development strategist. Having given, having given you this very brief account of the university's work, particularly in the World Hunger Program, I shall end these formal remarks on a more personal note. I am now moving into the last year of my five-year term as the first rector of the UNU. 
I am not seeking a second term because I think in an international organization the leadership should rotate. This has been an extremely exciting task and obviously a complicated one. I believe our accomplishments in building a new, useful world institution are substantial. But it appears that I may leave this assignment with a major disappointment that my own country will not have contributed financially to our work, even though the individual contributions of many Americans have helped to make it possible. Thanks to contributions or pledges from other nations, most recently the United Kingdom and the Federal Republic of Germany, the permanence of the United Nations University is assured. But how useful it can eventually become will depend, I believe, in large part upon the financial support or lack of it from the United States, still the richest country in the world. Our eventual goal for the endowment fund is $500 million. We have hoped the United States will eventually contribute a total of $50 million, a far smaller proportion than it has usually contributed to other UN organizations. But all we have sought so far is a first contribution of $10 million. It hasn't happened yet, and it means a lot more than $10 million in the worldwide impact that it could have. The lack of a U.S. contribution is clearly having a negative effect on contributions from other governments. Traditionally, the United States has set the global pattern for U.N. contributions. Several Western European and North American countries have stated explicitly that they will wait to see the extent of U.S. support before they give to the endowment. For the last, Congress is not blind to the new realities of our time. For the last three years, the Committees on Foreign Affairs have supported an authorization. The difficulties have come in the appropriation process. The time must come when the Congress will affirm the common obligation that the UN University and this nation share to help give those less fortunate than we a better chance to develop their own self-reliance. In doing so, we cannot help but strengthen ourselves and the chances of a better future for the whole world. Thank you.